Great. Again, welcome. This is Tim Pullman from IPlytics, and today we're running our webinar on SEP deals, the long and often winding road. To kick it off, today we will talk about, and we have two great speakers, um, how SEP, SEP deals are actually you know, successfully done, and why is it more and more important? Because we have increasing challenges out there. Um, SEPs are actually not licensed these days any longer, only in the smartphone or computer world. We have other industry verticals, starting, of course, with the automotive industry um, that are using standardized technologies like 5G, 4G, Wi-Fi technology, also video compression or wireless charging technologies, and where SEP deals matter. And this will go further. We will see it in the smart factory world, smart energy world, smart healthcare even, or smart home. Looking at the number of patents, the numbers has been actually have been increasing in the past years, in particular because of 5G, it's a very patent heavy technology standard. Um, and of course, because of those increasing numbers of patents, of course, we also see increasing need to get a license and access to them. And some people call it the next battlefield of SEP litigation. We did see a lot of um, you know, um, litigation in this area because it's a new one. We have uh, an industry like the auto industry that is not yet used to, um, you know, sign deals with, with SEP owners, uh, an industry that wasn't affected by SEP licensing in, 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 in years, but now they are. And we do see there is some dispute also here, um, also something that we will touch on today. But since 2019, we did see a lot of litigation. And just in the past two weeks, we did see two more litigations popping up in the US, um, L2 Mobile versus Ford and Intellectual Ventures. There's the open litigation against General Motors, Toyota and Honda at um, courts in Texas. So we do see there's something going on right now um, which is, you know, that SEP licensing is challenging in the market. Looking at litigation um, in general also shows us that we do see most of the litigation for the telecommunication or cellular standards, like the 2G, 3G, and 4G. However, also other standards are important, like wireless standards, video compression standards. And also in the past, we had a lot of audio compression standards or DSL standards um, that, would, that would matter. And where we do see litigation, um, looking at that over time actually shows that in particular, again, litigation has been driven by um, the, the, the larger cellular technology projects like the 3G, 4G, and 5G. But today is not about litigation. This is really to, just to kick it off and show that, you know, the numbers have been increasing in the past years. Today, we also want to talk about actually what is actually the more typical case, not that people litigate, but that people actually sign deals, sign contracts. And this is what, what it's all about today. And this is also why I'm super happy to have a great panel here with, with Roger Martin, Tim Berkus, and Jeffrey Belk. And um, I will hand it over now to Jeffrey, who will take over the moderation of this panel. Jeffrey, who comes, um, you know, who after 14 years at Qualcomm joined into digital in 2008, where he was a board member and the EVP of business development. And, you know, he has over the years gained a lot of experience with SEP deal making. So I'll hand over to Jeffrey now. And, you know, I'm looking forward to this great panel and discussion. Thank you, Tim, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, that's uh, pretty much it for the slide. We do have some poll questions as well. Uh, this is intended to be a bit of a, a freewheeling conversation. Uh, we will have time for, for Q&A at, at the end. What we're going to try here is have it be a, a little bit different from some of your, uh, hopefully, some of the sessions like this in the past, in that you have three people here that all have been uh, you know, deeply involved in the SEP space and the licensing space for, for decades. In my case, uh, I joined Qualcomm in early 1994. So it's been um, 20, 30, 27 plus years. Uh, in Roger's case, he uh, retired from being chief patent strategist, global patent strategist for Qualcomm after 25 years. And in Tim's case, uh, you know, 30 plus years as well across a range of activities. I'm going to let, you know, in the course of this, because I'm going to focus on Roger with some commentary from Tim Pullman to start. I'm going to start and let Roger introduce himself. And, you know, Tim and I are still in this business and we're still doing things here. Roger's taken a bit of a left turn and is a uh, CEO of nonprofit. And the way I was actually able to entice him is uh, he's going to introduce himself and tell us a little bit about his nonprofit. He knows that there are a lot of lawyers out there. A lot of other folks out there that may want to uh, participate. So, Roger, if you could 
uh, spend a few moments introducing yourself and introduce your nonprofit, then uh, we'll go down the path from there. Thanks, Jeff. As Jeff said, I, uh, I worked at Qualcomm for 25 years. I retired on my 25 year work anniversary to go full time into nonprofit work, in particular, in using technology to prevent human trafficking and sex trafficking in, in particular. And I run two different nonprofits. One has developed some AI based technology that can identify um, you know, sex trafficking recruiting going on on social media. So kids getting approached by predators, it can identify and characterize that. That technology um, is, the, is, is in an app that's on the iPhone for parents called Radley. <clears throat> and it's been featured in um, the NBC documentary Stolen, which is now streaming live on uh, NBC's uh, Peacock service. And uh, in a new documentary called It Happens Right Here, which is actually debuting this Saturday in LA at LA Live at a film festival. So if you happen to be in Southern California this weekend and looking for something fun to do, make your way to downtown LA and uh, see the screening of It Happens Right Here featuring um, our technology. And then the other nonprofit that I run provides legal services, right? I was a patent attorney and, and, a, and a lawyer, right? Licensed in California. So I thought I should get involved in the legal defense of sex trafficking victims, survivors of sex trafficking, and they often need um, their criminal records cleared because they get you know, arrested for prostitution or for drug charges, assault, all the things that they're forced to do while they're being trafficked. And um, we, in, in a group called Free to Thrive, Free to Thrive, um, uh, we, we provide free legal services to clear their criminal records, to get them custody of the children that they, they may have had while they were being trafficked, to um, get restraining orders against their pimps, and whatnot. And uh, just to, because you're all lawyers, or most of you are lawyers, I will suggest to you that um, even as a patent lawyer, I didn't know anything about criminal law. But after a while of dealing in this space, I felt like I should learn enough and become involved. So if anybody wants to become involved as a pro bono lawyer, or um, get involved in you know this, this issue of social media and human trafficking, it's just been eating at you for a while, uh, you can contact me. Let me, I'm going to put the uh, link to my to the website in the chat to everyone there. It's humansagainsttrafficking.org. You can see a little bit about our technology and so forth and contact me uh, through there. So that's what that's what I'm doing. And I also do some IT consulting on the side because it helps fund uh, my nonprofit work. Perfect. So uh, uh, thank you very much, Roger. And, uh, and again, I know uh, from all of my lawyer partner friends out there that the that, uh, last year and a half uh, has been challenging on one level and uh, but on the other hand for for many lawyers and law firms quite lucrative as well so if there's a you know a bit of time and time available uh, in your schedule I, I would invite you to reach out to Roger and his team and see how you can assist okay Roger getting into it here so, you know, until your retirement, you arguably uh, manage the largest and most complex um, portfolio in, in, in the wireless industry. Uh, you know, one of the things about the, the uh, Tim, Tim, you and myself being around this for decades, this isn't, uh, to use a colloquial English term, this isn't our first rodeo. We were, went through the transition from 2G to 3G, from 3G to 4G, 4G to 5G. And now down the road, we're seeing the first inklings of what 6G would, would talk about. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the processes and timing of how a portfolio uh, is constructed. And I think you mentioned in uh, one of your bios, I, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars your budget was and how many, you know, how many engineers were in the process. But one of the things that, that you know, when, when we start going into licensing cycles, there's starting to be litigation that's visible that Tim Pullman just commented on. People don't understand the, the complexity and the amount of time it takes uh, be, before that, you know, that part of the iceberg surfaces. So maybe if you spend a few minutes uh, the, describing your, your experience there. Yeah, so, uh, well, first of all, I was fortunate to work at, at Qualcomm, which was and has been a leader in this space for more than 30 years. And, you know, they pour 20% of their revenue, right, into R&D you know, seven to 10 years ahead of market. And that's really where you need to be if you really want to be a serious, uh, you know, player in standard essential patents. Not all standard essential patents are, you know, created equal. 
you know, the ones that are really critical to the things that matter uh, to the consumer and matter to the carrier, uh, those tend to get, you know, sorted out really early in the standards development, right? Really fundamental architectures. And so Qualcomm was always playing in that space. So a lot of the, you know, a lot of what I did there was just try to make sure that I was taking care of, you know, work that other brilliant people, you know, were, were doing. And I was, I was sort of very, very lucky. So I'll just, I'll just say one of the first things you got to do if you really want to be in, you know, an important player in, in standard central patent market is you got to be very early and, and very active. Now, now, actually, let me let me dig down a little bit. You mentioned seven, eight years, and you know how you know th those investment decisions, those R and D decisions, when those are made and the engineers start working on it today, you know that's not above the surface. And is there any? There's no real assured return on investment at that point. No, it's it's all speculative, right? Um, you know, it's, everybody kind of understands that there's a tremendous amount of risk involved in in R and D, and that not only does it take 10 years before you see any return on that R&D investment, but also the likelihood that that stuff makes it to market isn't at all assured. Just because you are making standards contribution and playing in standards does not mean that that, that standard feature is either gonna get adopted and even if it's gonna get adopted, it doesn't mean it's gonna be widely used. Ultimately, it's gonna depend on you know, how, how good, how compelling that invention is uh, to begin with. So. You know, in, in a lot of spaces, IP is there to allow people to recover the, the return on the investment of these extraordinarily and highly capital intensive investments they make, you know, 10 years out, out in the future. So when you when you make those decisions, the engineers have, have the innovations and you have to construct a portfolio that ultimately, you know, will be monetized, will be licensed. What are some of the decisions you make in terms of, you uh, you know, timing, geography, venues, et cetera. And, and how does that evolve, uh, you know, over the decades that you were there? Because it definitively evolved. <laughs> yeah, so in the very early days, you know, Qualcomm invented a ton of good stuff and kind of threw it all into the bucket, right? And that bucket it would license for, let's say, 5% for multi-mode units. I think it's still 5% for multi-mode units. But over time, the more that you invent and the lo longer that you're playing in that, the more the patents tend to cost and, and so forth. And the ability to kind of maintain um, that large of a portfolio gets challenging. And you start to realize that, again, even all your own patents aren't created equal, that some of them are on what we would call bit twiddling, right? Um, meaning something that is potentially standard essential, but doesn't really drive the uh, functionality, you know, the real core um, benefits that you get from the standard. And so you try, to, you try to characterize your portfolio from the stuff that's sort of least important, if you will, to the stuff that's most critical. And the stuff that's most critical, you groom the hell out of it, right? And then you file it in all the places where you think the customers, where you think somebody would pay you for the right to use that, right? I mean, ultimately, patents are about the ability to affect somebody else's behavior. And so you wanna have a patent where you wanna affect somebody else's behavior. Obviously now that's all manufacturing going on in China. Um, and then of course the big user markets are in you know, North America and Europe. And, and then of course there's emerging uh, places as well, China and, and the rest of Asia. Okay. But I'll, I'll just say um, it's easier uh, and my job was easy because I had this embarrassment of riches of great inventions made by great inventors, right? So it's hard to it's hard to screw up. But that's all I had to do was like not screw it up. Okay, so what's um? So I'm going to ask one question, then I'm going to go to Tim Pullman to amplify kind of the the role of uh, external platforms like IPlytics and and other tools out there to do it, but. Yeah, I, I usually use a pyramid analogy, but I used an iceberg analogy a, a few minutes ago. So, you know, seven, eight, 10 years in, in advance of the standard, a company, and, you know, I, one of the things I can provide is a bit of a board of directors perspective, because I was on InterDigital's board for eight and a half years, is well in advance. Yeah, I, I joined the board in 2010, and they were already deep into the 4G licensing cycle, and 5G investments started being made not too far after that. So well in advance, there has to be investment decisions made uh, against a technology that, you know, 
in, in, in board meetings, you have discussions of, well, what sort of return is this going to have? And, and the answers are, you know, often like Roger describes is you just don't know. You have ideas where the technology is going to go. You have ideas of where white space might exist, but you'll, the, the, the standards process hasn't occurred. So, um, you know, there, there's no real clear cut path to monetization, but no choice but to make the investment. So that being said, Roger, um, you guys make the investment, the patents are going there. How do you, how does the company start to parse? What are the really, really clear winners? Because if you look at a iceberg, it's only the stuff it, uh, above the surface and maybe, you know, what are, the, and those are the, the gems that ultimately are going to be core to a licensing program and potentially asserted in court. So how, how does that process happen a little bit? We'll do a couple of minutes there Then I want uh, Tim Pullman to comment on the tool side. Yeah, uh, so it's going to be true for all patents, not just standard essential patents, that the value of a patent really depends very contextually on, you know, what you can do with it, right? Qualcomm had a licensing program, and so it would, it would shape its portfolio in a way that would try to maximize um, its ability to, you know, over the long term, uh, sustain its licensing business, right? But um, if, I can, if I can describe it generically, um, you want to make sure that you're identifying the patents that really drive the revenue stream that you are licensing for. That is, in all damages calculation, in all reasonable royalty you know, uh, calculations, in all negotiations, um, the more the patent really drives the profit of the licensee or the revenue of the licensee, the more they're going to be willing to pay for the right to use that, right? So um, if, if you have, like I say, the embarrassment of riches of having lots of stuff that really is critical and crucial to, the, to their revenue stream, um, th that's a good position. And in the, in the wireless space, it has to do with you know, things that allow you know, high data rates, large, which is really important to customers, large capacity, right, which is really important to the carriers so they can make money. Um, you know, low noise, uh, low, you know, power control things and, and so forth. The and things that drive a person to be able to con continuously communicate and hundreds of people in the same place to be able to continuously communicate at, you know, high, very high speeds. Okay, so Tim, your, your world is assisting people. So, you know, those investment decisions get made in advance. We're pre-standard, people are looking for, for white space. How do how does your company and how do you know others out there play in helping to uh, refine that pyramid or iceberg and 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 uh, you know assist that process? Yeah, as you said, I think it's um, patent valuation is is a very challenging task, you know. And um, what we do is we take it from the data perspective. And what's interesting here, what's different to you know patents that are not relevant to, to standards, that you can introduce another database, so you can look at. <laughs> patents in relation to standards, patents in relation to standards contributions. And, you know, cross-correlating these databases gives you a lot of insights on how close a patent may or may not be to the standard. And since we are talking about so many patents out there, very often it's not feasible to look at these patents one by one with subject matter experts, which is probably still the best way to do it. But, you know, we, we assist in that, cutting down some of the um, big data problems with really correlating, also semantically running claims against standards. And, you know, what is interesting here process-wise is that, for example, we look at also contributions so we can track everyone who goes to the 3GPP meetings, we can track what they submit, we can read, you know, and index that. And relating the, the timing of the submission of a contribution to when the patent is filed, when the standard is ratified, when the patent is declared, when the pool is formed, you know, these are so many um, things that are happening, you know, our platform tries to, um, you know, put some light and transparency around when, when it's happening and some intelligence that you don't have to work, work, you know, work through all these data points. So we're really assisting those people that, you know, have already a lot of knowledge, but we're just assisting to get it better and more strategic to them. Excellent. And, and, yeah, I think that, that process, uh, you know, I'm going to go to, to uh, uh, Tim Bergwies now, but for that process, I just wrote a piece on LinkedIn and it's posted on my uh, uh, LinkedIn profile pinned to it called uh, Standard Central Patents Goldilocks and Just Right, because this process is about getting to uh, 
just right. And you mentioned the SSOs and, you know, obviously a lot of folks are in the middle of this, but going back to what Roger was talking about and Tim Pullman just mentioned, it's not really, you know, sometimes the SSO dynamic in, in you know, in, in picking the, the, the technology standard. So every company is doing the technology work in advance or in conjunction with the standard. But yeah, you I know, just want to emphasize it's obvious. Many, probably the majority of folks out there uh, know it, but mo I'll say everyone doesn't. That is all uncompensated work. The companies all pay for that. They, they send their people to meetings, they all contribute. And you know, 3GPP doesn't compensate anybody for, for being as a part of the SSOs. So now we have the, we have the portfolio starting to be created. We have tools that are being used to help to, you know, define and refine and point companies in the right direction in terms of technologies. Now somebody's got to go out and license, and that's the the, the that's where where Tim uh, Berg, Bergeis comes to to play. Uh, got it right. Uh, and Tim, you know, you, from your background, we didn't do deep into bio. It's on, on the site, but you know, you started as an engineer with Motorola. You lived in Asia and you know, lived in Singapore, deploying systems. So you were very much hands-on in making this happen, and then transitioned into the licensing side. And why don't you talk about? You now have that portfolio. You're you're refining a licensing program, and you're getting out there. Why don't you talk a little bit about? Um, uh, you know, that process with kind of maybe moving into a focus of what's kind of broken into the system. Because I, I, I think that, you know, if it's if it was ideal, if folks like you could, you know, in your role at uh, InterDigital or sort of what you're doing now could go out there and sit across the table amicably, you know, do a deal in a day and go out for a nice dinner and a beer following, you know, we wouldn't have to have this seminar, but obviously it's more complex than that. So why don't you describe that process, a focus on what's broken and then together we're going to start come back and uh, collectively talk about uh, a couple of other issues and how we can improve things. Sure. Um, so as Jeff mentioned, uh, 30 years in the telecommunications industry, uh, working for both Motorola and InterDigital. Um, uh, retired from InterDigital in June of 2020. Uh, started my own consulting business um, and have been involved as a strategic advisor to uh, some startup companies. Um, I've also uh, been an expert witness in the uh, Optus versus App Apple case, the, the most recent one, um, which we can talk about in a little bit more detail uh, later on. Um, and then just recently, uh, I've actually started a, a position at a new company called Celerity IP. Uh, Chad Hilliard uh, is gonna be the CEO of that company and I'm gonna be the uh, president and strategic advisor. And we've uh, acquired the rights to license uh, a significant uh, Asian portfolio uh, from an operating company based out of Taiwan. Um, more information will be coming out on this over the next couple of weeks, um, but there's certain things I can mention. So we're being funded uh, through a private equity firm out of Chicago, uh, GLS Capital um, is providing the funding for that. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to starting that, uh, that new program as well. Um, with respect to licensing, I mean, the, the process itself is pretty well known. Uh, you know, you start out with a, a simple letter introduction uh, sometimes that includes a notice uh, with with patents, uh, you know, and, and products that are being uh, that are utilizing uh, those patents. Um, and then typically, you know, there's introduction meetings, uh, and then you go through generally a very long uh, process of technical evaluations. Um, and then, you know, you never ra ra rarely do you ever see eye to eye on the on the on the value of those uh, with respect to the implementer and, and the patent holder. Um, but after, uh, you know, usually after a year, year and a half, you can start to tell whether or not a deal is going to be able to get done. Um, why, why a year to a year and a half? What's a, and, and I know we're, we're, where we're headed with this is I know you have some very strong opinions on holdout and how that's changed over time. But why a year? year why, why isn't it? Uh, why can't you just go and you know, especially somebody you've licensed before, go sit across the table, hammer it out and have a beer. Yeah, I think, look, I think generally, uh, you know, people responsible for inbound licensing uh, for, for operating companies, um, you know, they have an obligation uh, to their management, to their, you know, to their shareholders uh, to do their due diligence. Um, you know, so they're going to do technical reviews and, and, and that's fine and acceptable and understandable. Um, what I think is always the hard part, uh, and again, the, the larger the portfolio, 
um, you know, generally that corresponds to larger uh, SCP deals. Uh, so it's going to re require a little bit more technical review. Um, you know, I, I found, you know, a couple things have changed over the last decade, uh, for sure. I mean, it used to be quite common uh, to send out notice letters, to send out, you know, requests to, to discuss patent licenses. Um, and, and, you know, mailings would get returned, uh, undeliverable, uh, even though you know you had the right address. Um, people would, you know, set up meetings, cancel them, sometimes after a significant travel time and expense. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure... Well, actually, Tim, don't, don't be polite people. Let people know. You've, you've flown to Asia with the team for a long scheduled me meeting only to land and have people cancel on you. Yeah, and you know, I think this was, I'm sure anybody involved in this business has experienced similar, uh, similar situations. And yeah, no, but I, you, think you, I mean, you, you, you've talked about the dynamic going from, you know, what you just talked about is there was a process of due diligence and a a natural process that maybe extended the licensing to now, you know, at least your sense of it is, it's just a conscious strategy to, you know, conscious tactic to push things out as long as possible. I think there's definitely a delay element and, uh, you know, in that technical evaluation and it comes in uh, willingness, you know, for these companies to have meetings, how frequently will you have the meetings? How many patents are you going to review? Um, you know, so I think you really have to establish kind of upfront what you, what the expectations are. Um, you know, and some expectations aren't going to match, uh, you know, the, the operating companies, um, you know, they're going, you know, they're going to demand a certain level of review. And, um, you know, and like, again, I think trying to find just, just even settling on something there, we're going to review 50 patents or we're going to review 25 patents, you know, can sometimes be real challenging. Um, and then getting the meetings kind of set up, um, you know, and the meetings are all the same. Uh, you, you go through a long process. Um, you know, many times you have three or four uh, engineers from the other side, um, you know, for each patent, right? And, you know, we'll bring, you know, one patent expert that represents our whole portfolio to a meeting. Um, so, but, but in any case, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a part of the process that we have to deal with. Um, but I think it is something that going forward, you know, that would be something that would, there should be some reasonable amount of time that is allocated. And these companies have enough resources, you know, to do this in a timely manner. Um, okay, and there's well, really no reason to spread it, spread it over 18 months or two let years. Let me apply one, one, one thing to there and question, question down. Uh, there, for both Qualcomm and, and an interdigital and an Nokia and Ericsson and others out there, there are companies that have uh, been part of the licensing cycles and have been licensees through 2G, 3G, 3G, 4G, 4G, 5G, you know, literally for decades. Are, do those companies behave, if there is a history of, you know, obviously it's a new set of patents, it's a new cycle, but are the typically the existing companies better behaved or worse behaved, or is there some dynamic you can characterize there of, you know, new players versus someone where a company might have a 20 year old, 20 year licensing history? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think, it, you know, it varies obviously across companies. Um, but typically, uh, if, if you have an existing license with a company, um, you know, those discussions do tend to uh, move forward a, a little bit quicker. Uh, of course, they, you know, this is an evolving industry, right? And, and it ebbs and flows, uh, you know, the loss of the uh, injunction, um, I think was, was very hard on the patent holders. Um, and I think provided too much of a, an advantage to, to the implementers um, because that's when holdout really became big. And then, you know, now the courts are starting to recognize holdout and, you know, guidelines have been established with respect to, um, you know, how you're, how both parties are kind of expected to, to respond um, to these negotiations. Um, and, that, and that's been a, a positive shift, but what I, I like to use the term, what it's led to is you know, more sophisticated holdout. Um, and, and those things become uh, you know, introducing legal theories that uh, are new. And again, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I, can, I think I can get away with saying this. I mean, there's, there's obviously valid reasons to introduce certain things, um, but you, you can't ignore historically how patents in a particular industry uh, have been licensed and why they were licensed that way. Um, and, and look, I mean, this industry 
is amazing. We started in the you know, late 80s, early 90s. We had multiple standards and um, you know, everybody had technologies that differed from country to country. You know, this, th this, whole, this industry itself has been the most globalized implementation of a standard uh, ever. And, uh, you know, a lot of that is because of the standards. Um, and the world recognized, you know, how important it is to be able to, to communicate with one device in any country anywhere in the world. So it's, it's global in nature, um, you know, and then yet some of these licensing discussions become, you know, very jurisdictional based. Um, yet, it, you know, phones are manufactured all over the world. Phones are obviously used all over the world. People travel, phones work all over the world. So, you know, I think part of this is that you're, you're dealing with these kind of these legal issues around jurisdiction, um, around, you know, where do you license in the value chain? Um, yet, you know, you got to take a look back and look at this standard and look at the value that it brings. Um, and, and people have to realize that. And if we can all work off of a common kind of set of assumptions on how these patents should be licensed, I think we'd all be better off. And I think it would make the negotiations a little bit. I want, I want to come back to that because that bridges to the, you know, where, where this heads to, which is transparency. And then I want to ask, uh, have Tim Pullman amplify this a little bit. But yeah, I think that you have two sides across the table. And I use the historical piece because obviously, you know, folks having a 5G icon pop up on their phone now uh, doesn't mean that suddenly that phone is completely 5G. Their phone is sometimes leveraging 3G still and pretty much always leveraging 4G technology and a lot of 5G is just an extension of that. So it is a, it is a continuum, but I used an iceberg analogy before and maybe a real estate analogy uh, you know, is better in terms of transparency because houses in, in your neighborhood do give you an indication of value but you know, if somebody has a basement, you don't know whether there's three feet of water or mold issues or problems, et cetera. You, know, you need definitely resources and experts to help define you know, what that comp is and help define where their value is. Tim, in this set of the process, describe how folks at, who are at the table you know, doing this would, would be leveraging yourself and other things out there. Then I wanna come back to Roger and say, okay, now you're a bit further down you know, now, now we're going to go, you know, touch a little bit on the litigation side, but Tim, if you could talk about people at the table, you know, what sort of things can facilitate that process and, and make the value a little bit more clear. I, I, look, uh, no, you know, actually, this, like, uh, people, that's for Tim Pullman. Sorry. I, yeah. I forgot. <laughs> oh, you're muted, Tim. Just quickly. I mean, what, what we see, um, in our experience, I mean, we work for both sides of the table, implementers, same as the, um, the patent holders. Um, and often, you know, what, what is between a, a deal is the appreciation of, of the value of a portfolio, right? Of course, one or the other side has a different opinion on that. And we as a neutral, you know, data provider want to help there, you know, first of all, have transparency on, on both sides, and then also discuss a metric that one can agree on to get an understanding of the value of a portfolio. Right, and I think um, you know transparency here is, is a first big and, and important step towards that. Um, and I think um, you know to to avoid you know these kind of situations that Tim described. But to be honest, also from our end, we hear stories from implementers that are similarly bad. You know, getting like weird um, uh, printed lists of patents that no one can 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 really understand what they should be about, and you know without any evidence and understanding of what it's about. So I think we um, we are trying to be there uh, in the middle. Uh, and help as, as much as we can as a data provider, right? I mean, there's just that much to data, but you know, that part we're pretty good at. So now I'm gonna to go to Roger and Tim. We're gonna bring, bring the, the two of you together. So now, you know, you, you've assembled a portfolio, you've gone out there, asserted it, there's ever more sophisticated holdup strategies. You know, there, there, there isn't a, you know, a, a fast path to a deal. So now there are multiple strategies that, that, that come into play. You know, Roger, you, you know, you had some interesting thoughts about, you know, these are patents, they're SCPs with different characteristics, but there are patents and somehow, you know, sometimes that isn't uh, communicated appropriately, but now you need to take it to the next step. It goes into the public domain, you know, potentially there's arbitration and then, uh, you know, potentially, uh, uh, you know, picking what patents get litigated. So let me 
let me ask uh, uh, Roger first, going down that path, maybe a couple of your comments on, you know, just some reality around what the patents are, you know, and, and the rights surrounding them. And then how, you know, you don't have to use a Qualcomm example, but more generically, how a company would select what patents they would go to litigate. Because one of the things that, you know, was interesting with the IP Linux folks is they, there's one chart they had that literally had a section of a standard with uh, 20,000 patents. And then it kind of goes through different attributes. But if I recall, it was less than 200 of those have actually been litigated globally. So Roger, talk about that. And then Tim, you know, Foggy Bridge to you, Tim Burgess, Bridge to you to talk about, you know, your thoughts on arbitration and litigation as well. Yeah, so let me just start with the theme that, you know, standard essential patents, um, yeah, they're, they're patents that somebody has said are infringed, right? Somebody is of the opinion that that patent, they call it a standard essential patent. Whoever's saying that is of the opinion that it's infringed by people who implement the standard. That may or may not be true. And the patent may or may not be valid. And so um, it, it may be that the claims are, you know, miss the mark. And it may be that there's stuff in the file history that, you know, or, or it's invalid because that particular feature was in a previous version of the standard or in a different standard or something of that effect. So I like, just because somebody says SCP doesn't mean um, that that patent has any value. It just means that they've got this hypothesis that somebody infringes it. And then, so which patents are you gonna go to litigate? Um, well, at, at Qualcomm, my job was to tell, try to select those. Um, the good ones, you know, I know that sounds like a flippant answer, but the ones that you believe are, you know, fundamental that you can prove, um, you know, there's infringement that you haven't just claim charted against the standard, but that you have the, you know, the, the device that belongs to the, uh, infringer, you know, the infringing device and you've tested that and the ones that you have groomed and, you know, if, made sure that you're uh, pretty aware of what the prior art is because in a litigation, there's so much money at stake that people will overturn you know, every rock, right? They'll spend millions trying to defeat that patent. So you just spend years trying to make sure that you know all of the ways that patents can be defeated and you, you know, groom your portfolio in a way that those, you know, your patents won't be defeated. And um, at, at Qualcomm, we had a practice for licensing purposes, because of this holdout issue of making sure that we had, you know, lists of patents that weren't just sort of here's our SCPs, but for the, for which we had claim charts, and we could we could give them a hundred claim charts, and if they didn't like the first hundred claim charts, we'd give them a second hundred claim charts, right? And you know, there wasn't there wasn't a um, a reasonable argument that somebody could make that that all of those patents were either invalid or not infringed. And so the homework that you have to do um, in order to really, you know, expect somebody to, you know, take, take notice and, and pay you a fair, you know, licensing fee is, is tremendous. And you have to have lots and lots of resources. Luckily at Qualcomm, we have those resources. Um, I see lots and lots of smaller operations, you know, trying to cobble together uh, some things and take a shot with litigation and uh, you know that's never been what what Qualcomm was about. Like right? Qualcomm was about, hey, we invented stuff, we enable things, we help our, you know, we assist our customers and licensees in making money, and so we would take, um, you know, a fair, a fair and reasonable uh, license off. Yeah, actually, actually, before uh, Tim Burgeis com comes in, I want to amplify on that a, a, a little bit, and I do see the questions and comments. They're excellent. We're going to come back to some of them. Uh, at the end, China, Mark Cohen weighed in uh, on, on anti-suit injunctions. But you know, as somebody in another part of my life has worked with a lot of smaller companies out there that assemble I IP, you know, in some respect, the system frankly screws them because they don't have the money to hire the, the law firms. They don't have the money to create this foundation uh, against the IP sometimes. And the, you know, the bigger companies use the tactics we've talked about to stretch them out that, that it incurs costs. And, yeah, I've seen examples where companies with really seminal technology either run out of cash and uh, the IP is acquired by the bigger companies really cheap or 
the companies just wait until their cash flow is there. They can't raise any money. Maybe they're moving along and then they're acquired along with their IP uh, 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 less cheap, you know, at, at a below market price as well. So I think there's a dynamic there that uh, I, I think is counter to the market and counter to the spirit of innovation sometimes. Uh, you know, the flip side of that, of course, are companies that really, you know, don't have much by way of true innovation and, you know, are, are just asserting to, to get a check. And I, you know, I think, again, tools like uh, uh, Tim's, Tim Pullman's fix that. So, so uh, you know, Tim Burgeis, you know, your side, litigation, arbitration, I know you have some real, real opinions there as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, lit litigation becomes a, a necessary evil uh, too frequently, right? Um, and, you know, I think when you have uh, companies, uh, you're not always going to see eye to eye. Uh, you know, at InterDigital, uh, I think almost always, and, you know, I, I hate to always say always because there may be exceptions, but, you know, when we were at the point where uh, it was clearly going to be a dispute, in some shape or form, we always offer arbitration. Um, I, and I think industry-wide, I don't. I think that that's a fairly common offer from patent holders um, and, and very, very rarely ever uh, agreed to or used uh, by implementers. Um, I, I come back to what I said earlier about, you know, the fact that this is a global, it's a global technology and you have to look at it from a global perspective. Um, and, you know, an arbitration panel can do that, right? Uh, a court in a given jurisdiction um, generally uh, is limited. Uh, you know, the UK is, is obviously a very interesting uh, jurisdiction right now because, you know, they're the first court that uh, has taken what I'll call a very thorough uh, look at, you know, what FRAND means um, and, and put that in the context, you know, of a global license. Um, and if you look at that result, and this is the unwired planet uh, case where, it, you know, I thought that the court did a, a really great job. Is it perfect? It, nothing's going to be perfect, right? But they did a very thorough job. Um, and now you're seeing, um, you know, Optus, um, you know, I was uh, uh, fortunate enough to, to, to be uh, an expert witness in that case. I was asked to um, comment on the licensing side of that business, um, you know, in the case itself, uh, and Lord Mead, you know, again, I come back, UK is kind of the first jurisdiction that is willing to kind of put a global license as a requirement. Um, but now in this last case, you know, they, they actually said, you know, the patentee should be um, willing to commit to taking a license at the end of the process. I mean, you go through these processes and, and like I said, litigation is not something that should be taken lightly. It's very expensive. And, um, you know, to get to the end of it and have a potential resolution, but no agreement um, doesn't make any sense. And, and uh, Lord Mead recognized that. Um, and, and, and again, I just think it's, it's an evolution of, of how we're kind of going to deal with these issues. But if you have, you know, the, the, the licensor, the, the patent holder has that obligation at the end, they're not going to go through that whole process. And if the court says this is what a global rate should be, um, you know, both sides should be somewhat committed to that. And you can do that through arbitration. Um, you, you know, the courts offer some, uh, you know, additional legal protection, I guess, because you can uh, appeal the, the decisions and, 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 and whatnot. But, um, you know, there, there's, there's solutions out there. And, if, if they work and you really can't come to a negotiated deal, um, you know, it would be great to have a place to go and, and get the deal done uh, and not a jurisdiction by jurisdiction fight. Now so that, that's a tough one. So I'm going to, I, I want to come back to that, but I want to make sure we have time for, for Q and A, but I want to summarize a little bit and, and it's in my, you know, my just right article, but there was a abstract to a standards uh, Stanford law article on standards that I think sums this up and I probably should have said this up uh, up front is the process we're describing and this is not me this a direct quote is that standard setting organizations intellectual property law, laws is sort of a messy private ordering allowing companies to bargain in the shadow of patent law so basically ultimately this is about some sort of solution to to a negotiation and the patent law and the, and the court system is used as a framework to, to, to force that. 
there are four areas that, that, you know, obviously this goes across any place there's standards. And if you go back to Tim Pullman's SACS uh, pie chart in the beginning, you saw, you know, the, the broad range of SSOs that, that have SEPs. But there are, and we need quick answers to this one. So I want to make sure we get to some of the questions and the polls that Tim Pullman has. Um, there's four areas now that are going through the same dynamic. Automotive, you know, logically. Uh, video patents or, you know, with, with the importance of video and then IOT and open RAN. So it's kind of how, how, you know, how do the, you know, and it kind of goes to how, and quick, it's got to be quick. I apologize. It's complex, but how do folks see, uh, you know, those standards start, or, or especially in the automotive and, and IOT world, some path to resolution? Because in the wireless world, this goes on with a, uh, a framework where there are licenses that go back decades. There is an existing, uh, you know, an existing stack, I guess, of, of, of licenses and licensees that people would recognize. But for IoT and automotive, how, 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 does, how will this work? Maybe I'll start with you, Tim Berge, Bergeis. All right. Well, what I'll say is, you know, and again, this is another evolution, right? Um, I, I think when you had established licensing companies, um, you, you had comparable agreements and that kind of formed the basis for, um, you know, your, your licensing program. And um, so uh, like Roger, uh, you know, Interdigital, you know, I came in and they had an established kind of baseline. Uh, so it's not like we had to create one from start, um, but with each technology uh, generation, um, you kind of do have to start. Um, you know, you have to think about what's the right rate. Um, I, I come back to, and this is, and then you've seen a lot of apportionment arguments, and this is where patent counting comes in. Um, you know, but one of the big changes is that you, you started this top-down analysis, and what's what's the total royalty stack? And you know, I think that there's a, it's an important way to look at the the situation, um, but I think you have to look at value, and it doesn't matter if you have. 20,000 patents or 10 patents um, that read on this technology, the technology has inherent value. Um, and that value, I think, far exceeds um, any licensing stack. Uh, so, you know, I think you look at it, you know, how are you going to seed this market? How are you going to make, you know, allow the market to grow? Um, you know, you have to price it appropriately. But there's value to this technology. And you can't ignore that value. And now it's starting to be introduced to these other um, verticals, right? Uh, whether it's the automobiles, other IoT markets. I always tell a story, it's like, if you walked into an automobile manufacturer 20 years ago and said, I can put a hundred dollar device in your automobile that would uh, you know, allow you to get real-time feedback on things that are happening with that automobile. Uh, you'll be able to notify customers when they need to get their oil changed. So you can charge an even extra margin because you're going to have your special uh, texts that are required to change the oil. Um, you know, they would have said, I'm willing to pay $500 for that. Right. Yep. Um, and now all of a sudden it's a commodity, um, you know, so it, smart meters, you know, they used to send people out to your house to read meters. You know, how much money has been saved on a, uh, you know, again, a hundred dollar device that you attach to the side of your house yep. and it's there for 10 years. So well, I think, I, yeah, so, you sorry, know, so I think clearly you've got to look at this value and that's got to be kind of the starting point. And then let's look at a reasonable, you know, again, I think both sides have to look at this because you want the market to be big, a big well, market. A big I, market. I, I, I think, again, it's, you know, we, we could have another hour on small saleable unit and uh, its impact. But if you look at a car, you know, obviously it's, it shouldn't be based on a, on a chip and it shouldn't be based on value of car. But yeah, I think we could go for an hour on that, but I think we've got to switch into Tim's poll questions and then do so. I'll get to some, uh, we'll get to some Q and A from, from the audience. So Tim Pullman, jump in. So uh, Tim, do you want to comment on how this is working? Yes. Um, so you all should see now the, the questions. Um, and um, the first one is in your experience uh, or opinion, what is more up, up, you know, accurate approach to, to determine friend? Is it a top-down approach or a comparable license approach or none of the above? Second question is, uh, what's in, in your opinion, the best way for companies to decide the value of SEP portfolios? Is it a bilateral negotiation, threats, legal action, posed by a judge or posed by a regulatory rule? 
And then the third question is, do you think there should be more or less transparency by companies licensing SAPs around the structure and the pricing of their completed deals? Um, should there be more or should there be less? Um, so we let people answer like um, within some, some minutes. Um, you know, unfortunately our, our panel is not allowed to answer, but you can comment if you want to, uh, because you can, I don't know, do you see the, do you see, do you see the numbers already? Jeff, Roger, and Tim, you see some yeah, we, I, uh, we can't see the numbers. I'm just, I, just I, I see the quiz, but I, I, the poll, but I don't see the, uh, I don't see any, anything else. Okay, well then I, I, I will then end the questionnaire and then you should see it probably. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna comment on that because I'm sure this is gonna come out the same. The comparable license approach is great because uh, again, it kind of goes to what works and under, uh, you know, how we value a house, et cetera. And that argues to having more transparency and more data about deals that, that are done. And I think the, the industry can do a, 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 you know, a much, much, much better job of that. Um, you know, and, and I think that the most overwhelming response is, is on the on on the need for transparency. And you know, that's what's been interesting to me. And I've had conversations with Tim Pullman and and frankly the panelists as well. Is there's 30 years of licenses out there. Whenever there's a license deal out, the Wall Street guys or the folks in you know other financial markets do a good job of dissecting them. Whenever there's uh, court proceedings, unfortunately, you know. Court proceedings are public, but unfortunately, a lot of time the 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 transcripts are behind paid firewalls. You know, my sense is when I've been able to dig into this, there's a lot more information out there that would provide a, a framework for transparency that, that that exists. So let's get to some of the questions as well. Uh, you know, one of the questions is on you know uh, China and other other jurisdictions. You know, Tim, you mentioned the UK potentially setting rates. You know that leads to a question of other jurisdictions changing setting rates. How 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 can a geography set rates for any geography set rates for uh, for the world? And again, we have to keep these to kind of uh, 30, 45 second answers so we can get to more of them. Yeah, I guess, I guess I'll take a quick shot at it. Uh, you know, I think look, um, the UK is kind of an interesting thing because I think they're truly an independent jurisdiction. Um, they don't have, uh, you know, they have a a significant market, but it's not, it's not like a, a majority market by any stretch. Um, and, and they don't have any uh, significant manufacturers there. So, you know, I think that there's, there's always that factor. Um, but I think if you look at the process that was utilized, uh, it was well thought out. And so I think any jurisdiction that kind of takes on that is going to, you know, have to be very transparent, um, like the UK has been. Uh, about how they kind of came to their conclusions. And again, you'd like to see some commonality across jurisdictions. Uh, it might be a little bit of a, uh, a dream, but uh, every once in a while, it doesn't hurt to dream. <laughs> okay, now the cross jurisdiction thing is interesting, it goes back to something I'd like Roger to comment on because you know the big companies have been doing this for decades. You, when you folks assemble a portfolio, you're obviously filing across multiple jurisdictions with an eye toward if you needed to litigate or assert and you know certain litigate in in those jurisdictions. Obviously, that's a, a evolved over time. But the other side of that, you know, again, that favors the big companies is the maintenance fees go through the roof for those patents over time. So, how what what sort of your views on you know th this globalization of a, a assertion and litigation and and courts weighing in, Roger? It takes a lot of resources and a lot of money uh, and you take a lot of risk in order to have a global licensing program. Um, that's something that like say Qualcomm, other some large companies that were you know early in licensing are able to do. It's not as much uh, available to smaller companies who are just you know looking to try to make a buck on something they think is a, an SCP. But the, the basic idea is um, if you want to collect a royalty from someone who's got some activity in country X, you need to have some rights in country X and in, in, not to enforce so much, but to license, right? The, a patent is a vehicle for, you know, uh, for identifying rights that can be licensed. And, 
if, the, if there's no right that can be licensed, you shouldn't expect the royalty from it. So, you know, for Qualcomm, uh, the, you know, the ubiquity of cellular communications caused us to file in, you know, 150 countries, I think at one point, uh, and maybe it's scaled back, but, you know, every country, there are users and, you know, every country needs something. I'll, I'll, let me just uh, editorialize a little generally on this, on this panel. These are the same discussions that people have been having for 15 years. That is balancing SEPs and, you know, implementers versus patent holders and risks and what's Fran and who should set Fran and stuff like that. Well, the thing that occurs to me is the fact that we're still talking about it 15 years later. Uh, and, you, and this conversation would have been relevant in you know, 2G to 3G or 3G 100%. to 4G. The fact that we're still talking about it, I don't think that's a legal issue. I think that's a PR issue. I think the people who own patents and are trying to license them have done an exceptionally um, weak job in PR. If Who do you think the general public believes are the most innovative companies in the world? They'll say, whoa, Apple, Google, you know, Facebook, there exist companies that do really good PR about their innovation. And if you're not one of them um, and you want to be collecting, you know, royalties from the ones who are, you fight that uphill PR battle. It's in the minds, it's already in the minds of the regulators, the people who make the laws about, you know, how much you can charge. It's in the mind of the judges, even if they're trying to be, you know, fair, it's in the mind of the jurors. Um, if, if they never heard of you, and but they have heard of somebody else, um, you've got a PR problem. And so if I had you know, one sort of piece of advice generally to this industry, it's that um, stop having these, these 15 year old arguments and go out and prove to people the value or convince people of the value of what it is you have, and then you won't have to argue so much. I feel like oh, patent oh, attorneys oh, just want to oh, argue oh, about it. I'm I'm going to add one more challenge, one more challenge to that kind of uh, moder moderator prerogative. And there's questions on anti anti suit injunction. There's questions on China. I'd love to get to, and I, I think we can go another hour. But another dimension that may be a little bit new for folks in the audience is, uh, you know, from my perspective, I went from uh, you know senior management operational role to being a board member of. Uh, you know, multiple public companies. So one interdigital in this space, another one in the semiconductor space. I've been on the board of private companies. And the the I was on the board of one company that had a transaction and one of my fellow board members who'd been involved in 40 plus IPOs, uh, this wasn't a SEP deal, it was something else, but I think it's applicable, talked about what he called the country club test is uh, once you're at a certain scale, these decisions are board level decisions for both sides. And the board members will actually, one of the things in their decision is, and it goes to the PR value is, is this gonna embarrass the company by doing this deal? Is this gonna embarrass the, um, you know, the individuals on the board? Is it after his round of golf, is he, gonna, he or she going to be in the clubhouse and uh, you know, somebody's gonna give them, a, you know, give them a hard time because they did this particular deal. And that goes to, you know, let's say the external perceptions of deal. And I, I, I think as Roger has identified, you know, some th sometimes that's largely largely understated, and I, I'd say the industry has done a, a really crappy job of, uh, you know, talking about how the, the 15 to 20 billion dollars, at least for handsets of royalty flows, have enabled trillions of dollars of revenue and tens of trillions of dollars of market cap. Period. There's no question about it. That that's uh, specific. So. We're at time, so if people need to go, uh, they, that, that's fine. But I would love for both, you know, Tim, Tim, and Roger to give, you know, one, you know, 60 to 90 seconds each on if you had a magic wand, you know, how would you make the remainder of the 5G licensing cycle better, and what could we, you know, improve for 6G? So why don't we start with uh, uh, Tim Burgess? All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, I, I think if I had a magic wand. It, I think transparency is really important. Um, I, I think at least part of the argument that um, implementers have, you know, is, is surrounding, you know, they want to make sure that they're being treated, you know, relatively close to how their competitors are being treated. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a lot that companies can do. Uh, I know Interdigital's taken a step, you know, towards more transparency. Um, and I, I think the other big thing would be, 
you know, patent database integrity. Uh, you know, and Etsy's, Etsy was set up as uh, just a, a, a place to declare patents, um, whether they were, you know, standards or potentially standard, would read on the standards. Um, I, I think that that could be, there could be a version of that that would be more precise about which patents are actually read on the standards. Um, and I think if that was all in, in, in one place and it was a little bit more credible, I mean, you know, studies have been done. I know Tim has done a study that shows that 8% of the patents in the Etsy database are actually uh, read on the standards. That's just not acceptable, or at least with respect to that database, it's, it's almost useless. Um, because first of all, the companies that report, that probably varies a lot from company to company. Um, so, you know, one company might be at 80%, another company might be at 1%, um, you know, and, and, and they over declare. So I think that there's things that could be done on the patent side uh, with, again, with respect to transparency. Um, and then I think that, and I don't think it has to be to disclose every single agreement in specific terms because every agreement is very different um, uh, in, in many cases. So, but I think that there, from a transparency perspective, patent holders can be a little bit more forthright on kind of their, their process and their procedures um, and kind of how, how do they price things and, you know, what, what do they value uh, in, a, in, a, in a negotiation? Okay, Roger, and then we're, we'll let uh, Tim Pullman close it out with his thoughts and, and close out the session. So Roger, thoughts on uh, if Roger had a magic wand or you could, uh, uh, what would it look like? Yeah, I'd, I'll, I'll just double down on that uh, PR point. And I'll give you one really good example. If you remember the old cell phone wars, so-called cell phone wars, <clears throat> Samsung versus Apple, um, back in, I guess it's 2010 or 2012, so that, that time frame, right? Um, sort of the heyday of massive litigation worldwide, Samsung versus Apple, Android versus you know, iOS. Do you remember that in the ITC, Samsung sued Apple, lost at the ALJ level, right? Won at the commission level, meaning they were gonna get an exclusion order. Samsung won at that commission level, but then the president of the United States vetoed the exclusion order during the 60 day veto period because the, the idea of being the president or you know, excluding Apple's iPhones from the United States was just untenable. That is, no matter how strong, you know, Samsung's case was or rights were, or so, you know, no matter how much ripoff had happened, um, the political climate wouldn't stand, uh, you know, somebody excluding Apple's phones. Why did that happen? Because Apple's extraordinarily good at PR about their phones, the shape of their phones and the color of the screen and whether it's you know got a nice round edges and, and so forth. And the reality is that they're a system integrator, nothing against Apple, but they're not the people that are inventing the technology that goes into their phones, right? They invent things about user interface and then they really, you know, they really do a great job of advertising those user interface details. But let me just ask you where, do you, where do you charge your phone at night? Do you charge it on your bedside table? Yes, why? Because it's the last thing that you look at before you go to sleep. And it's the first thing that you look at when you wake up, it's your window to the rest of the world. And that connectivity is the most valuable thing. You don't have no idea what that phone looks like or what the user interface does while you're asleep, but you feel good because it's right next to you. If you doubt that, let me try, try this experiment. Go charge it in your kitchen tonight. You're gonna to have anxiety. How do I know that? Because you have anxiety when your battery starts to run down. You ever seen 5% or something on your battery and you start to freak out because pretty soon you're gonna be cut off from the rest of the world. All the important things that are happening in the world, you're not gonna know about, and nobody's gonna be able to reach you and you're not gonna be reaching. That is human connectivity. And that is what these, these you know, 4G, 5G standards provide. And that has nothing to do with the form factor that they're in. And so that story never gets told. The people who are SCP holders never do the advertising. They don't have you know, Steve Jobs standing in a, in a you know, turtleneck with cool slides and great videos that are well produced by, you know, directors who've won Oscars, 
you need that. If you don't have that, you're always going to be having these same discussions where you're like fighting just for the right to exist, right? You, you got to you got to realize that these are political battles that are played out in a political arena and they're based on public opinion and PR. And so and, and the, con take the some of the money that you were going to use, take some of the money that you were going to use to file patents and hire somebody to create a good video and make it go viral. That's what and, you need and the to do. converse of that is, uh, you know, as Sherlock Holmes would say, the dog that doesn't bark is we all get off the phone and get off of planes and different states or different countries or travel the world and everything works. And if, so, if a glitch doesn't work in an app, usually it's the app developer's fault, not the standards fault. So the fact that everything works everywhere is conducive to that. So we were running really long. Tim Pullman, some final comments and uh, close us out. And I want to thank everybody. Uh, again, uh, if I could do one thing, I'd run this an uh, hour and a half because we and get to more of the questions. So I apologize for that. So Tim Pullman. Yeah, also, thank you. I think it was a great panel from, from my end. Um, my, my magic one would be similar to, to Tim's. Of course, we're a data company. More transparency is needed. Um, I think it, we can go even, you know, the, the declaration database is one. You know, for me also, um, you know, arbitration is a great, great forum, but as a data person, it's all, you know, not public. I don't know who is in there. I don't know um, how much they resolved. You know, I would love to have a study around how efficient arbitration is, but there's no public data available. I think public data is needed to everyone understand what's going on and what's possible. And, you know, we want to see more innovation. Uh, we want to see less fights, um, you know, and I think that, that'd be my wish to, to go and, and help uh, to do that um, and, and moving forward from here. Okay. And any other final comments? Uh, uh, you're, you're our host. So if you want to do a little uh, uh, close out to benefit IP Lytics, fine by me. Um, I think I think uh, we already did that a lot. I think everyone knows us and what we do. Um, and again, you know, we, we can do just that much also to provide more to transparency. Um, SCP database is is not a perfect one, but it's a starting point. I keep saying, you know, it's it's the world world's largest database of potentially essential patents. And I think they they still do a great job of at least hosting it and collecting it. You know, we, the, the difficulty is now finding out what is really essential in there. Um, at IPLytics, we did we did a job in in you know manually mapping 2,000 patent families for 5G. So it's it's just a you know a random sample. It's a representative sample, but it's it's not all patents, right? And that's impossible. It's not feasible. We can do just that much. But if if everyone would do the, just that much, you know, everyone who is part of it, you know, we we may have a sample of. 20,000 map patents, and then we have a lot more transparency, even though even a, you know, a claim chart can be disputed, obviously, but we would at least know this patent is likely or less likely essential. So I think, um, you know, we could, if everyone would be willing, there would be a lot more transparency here. Um, but, you know, that, that is at least one way and one step in the right direction. Um, in, in particular, thinking about the new verticals, because those guys have a lot less understanding of what a standard central patent is. And unless you want to, you know, book the next flight like Tim uh, Burkus did and, and, you know, and, and, and not being accepted to a meeting um, because people just don't understand also what you're offering, um, you know, you need something, you know, more scalable maybe, right? And that is, that, that'd be, I think, um, more efficient to license out to all these verticals and new industries. Well, th again, thank you very much. Uh, I, I know some folks had to drop off. Thanks for those who, who held through this. And uh, thanks for Tim for uh, 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 putting the, this group together. And um, uh, we've got the Q&A. Do you, um, um, I, 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 there are other questions there. Do we typically come back to them or, or yeah, people, actually people can reach out to any of us on, on LinkedIn if they want to ask any questions, uh, you know, uh, specifically. And final to close is uh, for those that came late, Make sure you take a look at uh, Roger's nonprofit, Humans Against Trafficking. And again, for law firms who've done very well out there, assign some of your uh, uh, associates to do some pro bono work. And uh, Rod, even if you're outside the US, I'm sure Roger would love to talk to you. And with that, I, I guess I'll close it out. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have a good one. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.